Tonight's program is presented in association with the exit. That's Pat's job. You got me, Pat? How's that? Okay. So tonight's program Time is she'll in see association with the exhibition me. Light My Fire. Um, some propositions about portraits and photography. The show, which I hope you've all had a chance to see, continues through May, but a new iteration of the exhibition opens on October 22nd. So if you've already seen it, it's worth returning because it will change. Uh, our thanks go to Amia, the signature partner of photography here at the AGO. I'll introduce our guests here tonight and then hand it over to Sophie. They'll talk for about an hour and we will have time for questions following their discussion. Sophie Hackett is the Assistant Curator of Photography at the Art Gallery of Ontario and adjunct faculty in Ryerson University's Master's Program in Photographic Preservation and Collections Management. Her recent curatorial projects include Barbara Kruger, Untitled It, 2010, on the facade of this building, um, Where I Was Born, A Photograph, A Clue, and the Discovery of Abel Boulineau in 2011, uh, Songs of the Future, Canadian Industrial Photographs, 1858 Today, and of course, Light My Fire. And Christopher Wall's work has been recognized by American Photography, Communication Arts, PDN, Photo District News, the Annual Report 100, and the Magenta Foundation. Wall's work is, of course, part of the permanent collection of the Art Gallery of Ontario, and his iconic image of the Queen is included in Light My Fire, his recent portrait of astronaut Chris Hadfield as David Bowie graces the October 14th cover of Maclean's magazine, and I think it might be fair to say that he has photographed everyone, if not almost everyone, and his work celebrates and embodies the creative possibilities of portraiture in photography. Sitting next to Christopher is Barbara Astman, who has explored a wide range of photographic and mixed media throughout her career. Case in point, an installation of scarves based on her newspaper series opens tomorrow night at um, Ossington Avenue's Jonathan and Olivia. Since the 1980s, Asman's practice has also included a number of commissioned public art projects. She's currently represented by Cork and Gallery Toronto. She sat on numerous boards and advisory committees and works as a professor next door at OCAD University. So please join me in welcoming them tonight. Thank you, Kathleen, and uh, welcome everyone tonight. Um, I want to welcome Christopher and Barbara here to join me on the stage. It's my distinct pleasure to share the stage with them. Uh, and it was really wonderful to think about putting their work in uh, the exhibition Light My Fire, which Kathleen mentioned is on now. The current iteration is up until this Sunday. Next week, it will switch over to the new uh, version of the show, part two, which will open on October the 26th. So. As Kathleen mentioned, we're going to talk for about an hour, and then we'll take your questions. Um, I'm going to address questions sort of variously to, to, to Chris and to Barbara. Um, I'm hoping they might argue and or interrupt each other as well a little bit as we go along. Um, and we'll have some pictures to show you as well. <laughs> what? He's already growing. He's already fighting. Oh, 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 God. He's out of control. He's out of control. Um, so, really, with, with, with that uh, brief introduction, I think we should just really get into it. Get into what? <laughs> Portrait. I'll say, Kathleen, thanks for the lovely introduction. It was lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Launching the charm offensive. Here we go. Um, so, so uh, here before you, the two photographs that uh, by uh, Barbara on the left and Chris on the right that you will see in the gallery currently. Um, work from, uh, I guess, 1976, uh, Carol performing lilac tricks, and Chris's picture, The Queen in Winnipeg from 2002. Um, so I'm just gonna kick it off, really, uh, Barbara. What, what is a portrait, and uh, what is it actually for? When I think about portraiture, I really think about it's evidence that we exist, it's evidence that we're here in the world, and whether it's a portrait or self-portrait, it's what it means to be here right now. So, and the picture of my sister, one of the few images that we're gonna be showing that's not a self-portrait, it's a certain point in time of my life with my family in Rochester, New York, um, 
and taking an image of my sister in my parents' backyard, proving she's there. And what were those uh, lilac tricks? Oh, well, is anybody familiar with Rochester, New York? Okay, do you know they have a very famous lilac festival? Thank you, Maya. <coughs> this is going to be a quiz. Um, I moved from Rochester in 1970, and before that I had lived at home with my parents in Rochester, New York, and my father had the most beautiful lilac trees in the backyard. And during Lilac Festival, all the neighborhood trees all blossom at the same time. So the whole city is like permeated with this incredible scent of lilacs. To this day, when I smell that, it's just I'm back in a certain time and place. And I came home to visit, and my sister was still living at home. She's considerably younger than I am. And I had her go out in the backyard, and I was thinking about photograph. I always photograph my family every time I came home. And when I took this picture of her, I asked her to put some lilacs in her mouth. So she just put the little buds. I'm not sure how easily you can see those. And uh, I photographed her among the lilac bushes in the back. Well, then when I actually came back and looked at the image, I thought, uh, being somebody who's interested in materiality, I needed to actually put the lilacs on the image and not just have uh, my memory of that event of the lilacs in the backyard and not just a record of looking at the lilacs. So thus it became this, you know, very materiality, uh, very much about the object, making an object out of a photo. The sort of multi-sensory one or one to kind of conjure the multiple Yeah, senses. well, if I had my way, you'd be able to rub the lilacs and smell them, you know, like a scratch sniff, and sniff, a scratch and sniff photo, but I didn't have the technology back then. Something for next time, I guess. Yeah. Christopher, what is a portrait? And, uh, you know, you make a living <laughs> out of uh, portraits, making portraits. How? Uh, if Barbara didn't mention for? lilacs, I would have said ditto, I think, just to... <laughs> just to move right on with that. But and that's not my sister. <laughs> besides the obvious, um, besides the obvious being kind of creating a recognizable image of the particular subject that is, is in this case, sitting for your lens, um, I think what makes the difference between a portrait and a picture is definitely um, the sitter has to offer something. It's, it's participatory, it's, it's not just, you cannot just take something from someone particularly. I think they, um, they, have, to offer th they have to offer something up in the sense of um, whether it's trust or, or just a desire for, to make a picture in some way. I think it's, um, it's definitely a, a team effort, I think. So what was the queen offering up here in that well, the queen, particular the, picture? This is actually what I would call an observed portrait, not to to let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, but I'm, I'm not, this is not an official sitting with the Queen. Um, uh, at the time, I did a great deal of work with the Governor General's office, and I'd photographed some Governor Generals and some political folk and blah, blah, blah. Um, I think it was her Jubilee visit. I um, wrote a beautiful letter saying, oh, I would like to be the guy. I've been on royal tours before just as a newsman, and I said, oh, I'd like to be the guy who, who makes the official portrait of the Queen. And they said, oh, that sounds fantastic. And they explained how I should pitch it. And they ended up sending me back like a, an email that was like a link to like how to get a job in Canada. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It was like, I was like, I thought I, I, I couldn't believe it. So then needless to say, I, 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 I was gonna go traveling with her anyway. She went across the country, we went up to Nunavut and stuff. I wasn't on a mission. I was shooting for no one at the time, so I just kind of went on my own accord. The images ended up running in McLean's. Um, so I had the joy of not having to, to make a news picture in any sense, but I did know that I wanted to make an image that was just kind of identifiably her. Um, and I got lucky here in this case, just because it looks like she's wearing camouflage. She's actually giggling at a, uh, the woman from my big fat Greek weddings was standing to her right. Um, I'm in a hallway, the, the, the woman from the, the royal office or whatever it is was like, well, you can't stand here. And I'm like, well, I think it's a half decent spot. And she said, no, no, because the queen's gonna come here and there's like rules of where you can stand and where you can't stand. And so then when she came, at the time, I'm working with a Hasselblad with this big old strobe on top. I look like 
like a wedding photographer from like 1983, <laughs> but like new gear in 83. Um, and I shot two frames, and when I initially saw it, I was like, oh my God, her eyes are closed. And then the frame with her eyes open didn't look the same, and it just seemed like, oh, I seemed very pleased with it. So then I went to the magazine and said, oh, I have this great picture of the queen with her eyes closed. And they didn't get it. They didn't see what I saw particularly. They're like, do you have any with her eyes open? And I was like, well, that's not the point. <laughs> so. Well, I think that speaks a bit about uh, how you work and how you think about making a portrait, whereas you, know, you like the one with the eyes closed and the rest of the world might say eyes open, but eyes closed is what's in the collection here in the end, as it turns out. Yay. <laughs> All right. Pop quiz. Oh. I'm gonna read a quote uh, by one of the great fashion photographers, uh, or, well, great port Patrick. Pardon me, portrait and fashion photographers uh, of the 20th century, Richard Avedon. This is something that he um, first said in a talk in 1986 at MoMA, um, and then it was published later on. It's one of my favorite articles about portraiture. It's called Borrowed Dogs. Um, if any of you have uh, this monograph, I don't have the slip cover, but anyway, this monograph, it's reproduced. Read it, it's great. And I will read you part now. Uh, he says, portraiture is performance. And like any performance, in the balance of its effects, it is good or bad, not natural or unnatural. I can understand being troubled by this idea that all portraits are performances, because it seems to imply some kind of artifice that conceals the truth about the sitter. But that's not it at all. The point is that you can't get at the thing itself, the real nature of the sitter, by stripping away the surface, because the surface is all you've got. You can only get beyond the surface by working with the surface. All you can do is to manipulate that surface, gesture, costume, expression, radically and correctly. True or false? I'll take it on. Academic. <laughs> <laughs> I question this whole aspect of truth in photography anyway. I question whether if someone takes a photograph of me, there's any truthfulness in it. What does it say about me? Does it really say who I really am? All it is is a representation of me. It shows somebody this is what this person looks like. It really, in my mind, doesn't tell you anything about me at all. I've always felt that way. So I can see the surface, and I'm still looking at the picture of the queen, and we know so much about the queen that we can read into it because she's a historical figure, you know, she's in the media, we know so much about her, but if we show you a random image of a portrait of somebody you don't know, what do you really know about them by, by looking at it? You may make some assumptions about their socioeconomic class, you may make some assumptions about other things about them that come through in the photograph, but I don't believe that any portrait that's ever been taken of me has ever told the truth about me. So you agree with Avedon in the sense that a portrait is a performance? Absolutely, yeah. Chris? Well, I've never met anybody that's, you've shown up to take their picture and they were like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited you're taking my picture today. So it's right off the bat, you're dealing with that every time. Nobody wants their picture taken. So then you, you go through this rigmarole to try to make someone cozy. And it, that being said, I'm always very prepped with you know, what I'm gonna say right off the bat because I think it's a make it or break it. In a short period of time, particularly if you like are instantly a loser, then it's not really gonna work. Uh, you can fall into that category meaning, a little bit later. The, meaning you, the photographer. Yeah, the very word. much so. So you have to, like, it's instant trust to some extent. But I think more, like, they're, I think that at best should be more reflective of the time spent between the photographer and the subject at that time, and maybe that image is more representative of what that is, as opposed to the subject itself. We've all, whether it's a recognizable human or, or, or not, instantly you're going to, you know, oh my heavens, look at her gloves, or oh my heavens, look at this, and that's where we go, and that's how we judge people particularly. But I think if you stare at things long enough, you'll start wondering what the actual process was of how it was made, and I think we think that about, you know, great paintings, and, you know, landscape this, and, and this and that, it's, they can still be, it's, there's many kind of versions of portraits for sure, but. 
So this is a statement that you know, Avedon made in 1986, so we're kind of moving on 25. Is this still a quiz? Still quizzing? <laughs> no, we're just free, 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 to, free to be here. You can uh, react or not. I think Barbara got a better, a, a better <laughs> grade on that question. She I don't know. Like no grade. No grade. Applause meter yeah. out there. Yeah, maybe. Right her answer. All right. Um, it doesn't matter. So this is this is something that Avedon. <laughs> you guys settle down. Look out for this one. This one I'm coming to make. <laughs> okay. Okay. So 1986. This is a you know the the idea of that every, that that a photograph isn't truth is already something you know for him to speak as someone who's kind of worked in images for that for that long, um, would have been uh, probably to the audience at the time a pretty new concept. The idea of the self as a kind of performance, or that you perform in each context. Does it kind of seem obvious to us today that of course it would be that a performance that it would be a. It's kind of, it seems common sense to me, I guess, at this, this particular stage. Yeah, I think it's a given. Yeah. I think we make an assumption it's a performance. Um, you're performing for the camera. Your sitters are performing for you in the camera. Um, whether it's a portrait or a self-portrait, it's, it's all about the performance. Well, and then you'll often, you're, you're not just shooting one frame. So it's all the photographer's decision as what image is going to be shown I could show... Or the editors, for that matter. Right, for that matter. We could depict people in many different the ways. Dealer. The dealer has some say there, too. Um, nope. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's very selfish, the act of, of making and taking portraits, for sure. It's com Explain that, because I, I don't know that that's an obvious thing. <sighs> well, just in the sense of... Maybe in a, in a self-portrait, in a sense of... I, like I'm, very much the I'm very much the guy that would go in thinking... I'm not a discovery photographer in the sense, so I'm less likely to show up with Susie Smith and think, oh, wouldn't it be great if Susie swang on the swing and this and that? My, my idea would be, great, let's get Susie on the swing. It's going to be all backlit. It's going to be beautiful, blah, blah, blah. I'm like an executor, not a... I don't go searching for things particularly. Like, I know very much what I want to make. And, and then I just kind of call it quits after that. I don't really... I don't shoot forever, I shoot, I, my pictures take very short periods of time. I may chit chat for the longest period of time prior to, we're <laughs> to the point where subjects are like, okay, like, <laughs> we should really get this going. <laughs> but it's, uh, again, I, I kind of make them, don't take them. So what's selfish about that? Well, because they're mine. I'm just, I'm making something that, that's going to please me particularly. Mm -hmm. And it's my thought initially, it's not, even if, I, if I'm making an image for a magazine and so on, uh, thankfully, at least at this point, now they don't say, well, wouldn't it be great if we had, you know, Susie Smith with her eyes open? And I thought, well, my intention was to shoot her with her eyes closed. I think it might be best because that might depict the way that sitting represented our time together, particularly because she wasn't cozy, or she wasn't this and that, and she didn't fall for my shtick. So I think that image is, is that. Barbara, do you think about when you make your work, is that a, a selfish act, does that make sense? No, it's an act of survival. Yeah. It's a compulsion to make the work. And I never consider it selfish, because I hope I, when I make the work, it's a compulsion, and. It's what I do, but then I put it out there into the world for other people to either enjoy or not enjoy or accept or reject. You know, you can't control that part, but um, I never think of it as a selfish existence. It's a really hard existence, actually, to go into a room alone every single day and come up with ideas. Think about that for a minute. And nobody's telling you what to do. There's no assignment. And for my students in the audience, there's no, like nobody's saying, here's your assignment this week, here's what you have to do. And there's sometimes even no deadlines. So it really, it has to be a compulsion. So I never see it as selfish. If anything, I sometimes see it as like crazy, but not <laughs> selfish. <laughs> Good yeah. kind of crazy. That's me preparing for those jobs <laughs> until I get there. And then <laughs> So you, you both really charted quite different paths in photography um, through you know, a focus more on editorial work versus the things that are kind of shown in gallery or museum settings. Um, there are nonetheless some ways that you work or some things about how you kind of go about what you're going about to do um, that strike me as somewhat um, 
similar. So let's talk about, um, I, think I, I think I should have been talking about other. Oh, I like this one. <laughs> Hang on one second. I've lost my place already. That's not very useful at all. Um, so let's so let's talk about planning a shoot because uh, I know that you both of you um, and I can go back to the I don't know prior why I did image. That. I can see it here. Yeah, right. <laughs> like see it we big. can go back. Uh, it was really early work. Actually, it was exciting that Barbara sent this along because I'd never seen this particular piece, a self-portrait from the '70s. Uh, can you tell us a bit about uh, you know you, you you talk about sitting in your room by yourself, kind of trying to come up with ideas? Like, take us back there, '73, <laughs> whatever it is. What's going on? Okay, well, the original is a Polaroid, so I used to shoot a lot of Polaroids when Polaroid was readily available. And uh, before the series started, because I moved to Toronto and I really didn't have a lot of friends in the beginning. I have a lot of friends now, but I didn't in the beginning. And uh, so I was corresponding still with a lot of my friends back in the States where I grew up or wherever they had moved to. I know this sounds like I'm really going off track, but it does come back. So I would shoot Polaroids of myself. I guess kids now call them selfies. Huh? Well, you could do that with Polaroid. And then I would slap it in my electric typewriter, and I would write a letter to a friend, and I'd put a stamp on the outside and a little sticky label with the address on it, and I would mail them to my friends. So one day when I was doing that, I thought, what are you doing? This is an idea. <laughs> you can make art out of this, you know, as opposed to thinking of it as a one-off, just a, a little notion, something to have fun with with my own friends. Uh, also being involved in the mail art process, so I, I was very involved in that group of people who would send different kinds of interesting mail art to one another, and that was one of the mail art pieces. Uh, then at one point I thought, I'm going to turn this into a series and I'm going to take it seriously. I'm going to think about what I'm wearing. I'm going to think about how I'm posing. I'm going to set up different backgrounds. I'm going to put on costumes. So it really was extremely performative. So I had a pile of clothes in one corner. I had a list of names next to the typewriter. And I had a very small studio at the time with only one window light. So I had this, um, like, styrofoam board on this side that would bounce the light from the window, you know, never very sophisticated with my lighting here. Um, I would get up, I'd go in the studio, I'd procrastinate, but while I was doing that, I'd look at the list and I'd choose the person. This one's addressed to Jared Sable, and at the time, Jared Sable was my art dealer. <clears throat> Excuse me, so while I was thinking of the person, I'd think about, look at the pile of clothes, I'd put on an outfit, I'd tack up the color behind me, and then I started thinking about what's the story, what's the narrative, because there's always a narrative between two people, there's some story there, more than one story, but you had to pick one. Uh, then I would stand in front of the camera, it was a little Polaroid with a self-timer, I had 18 seconds to line myself back up on the little masking tape X on the floor. So you run forward, you go, doo, 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 you get it going, you run back, you get your pose, in this case, like this. Uh, very aware of body language, very aware of placement where I'm putting gesture, hands, um, gesture of, you could see I was a smoker once, uh, whether my hair was in front, whether my hair was behind, I was very conscious of every single detail that was in the image there. Conscious choice to even crop my eyes off. Um, wanted it to be almost neutral, neutral in terms of gender for at a certain point. And then I would take the picture and I'd quickly put it on a piece of graph paper, roll the graph paper with the picture on it through the electric typewriter. It was a Selectric for any of you who are interested. And I would start typing. And I think there's a whole generation of people who don't understand, but a typewriter actually pounds. Whoops, I made myself kick. <laughs> um, that was funny. It's like the doctor's office. Uh, it pounds the letters right down. So what you have, the text up there, is the absence of the emulsion, because the letter was pounded onto the Polaroid, push the emulsion aside, right? You with me? Okay. And so when you were done and you took it out of the typewriter, you had exactly two minutes to get your typing done. Couldn't worry about typos, couldn't worry about where this, you know, if you ran off the edge. So it had to be very much spontaneous, put it out there, get your story out there. And then when it was done, I would rub the carbon uh, ribbon ink off because there was always a carbon ribbon ink in the typewriter. I guess I could have removed it, I didn't know how. 
and just rub it off. Let the Polaroid fully set up, because sometimes you're typing before you'd even see everything in the image, and then hope that it worked out the way you wanted. For every final image there, though, there was then like five other copies of that, or versions of it, where I might stand with my arm a little different or put my hand lower down on my leg. Uh, then I worked with BGM. Anybody know BGM? Okay. BGM. Well, they were one of the only photo labs that I really knew about in Toronto, and I went there with this little Polaroid, and I said to them, I want to make this little Polaroid life-size. <laughs> I remember them saying to me, like, oh. Hmm. Um, so it was a technical challenge for them and for me, but we all figured it out, and they let me hang around them and do color tests with them. They were very, very kind in working with me, and uh, they were all blown up to life-size for that series. So that's the story of that. And so, for, and you know, in your work, for the most part, you've used yourself as the model. How did how did that come about? Because they're my stories. <laughs> they're my stories. They're not anybody else's stories. So each letter to someone in each of this, these images is my narrative, my story with that other person. Um, and the thought of trying to do something like this with another person just didn't make sense to me. And also, I never. And you're very good at it. You can direct people. But you know, when I would photograph people, I always felt like it was kind of a battle to get them to do what I wanted them to do. So there was this struggle, a real struggle, to say, no, 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 no. I want you to put your hand here. And no, I want you to try this. And I think, this is my story. I should just do it. And what was, you know, thinking about the 70s at that particular moment, you have a kind of a kind of new awareness of women's rights and a certain context and so what is it about telling your story that seemed did it seem urgent to you does it seem important did it 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 seemed allowable at, at the very least it was definitely questioned um like because they're little stories right they're not big stories they're little stories they're just little stories about my life or my relationship with this person the friendship whatever so they're actually little stories and I didn't know what the word feminist meant when I was doing the work. I just knew that I was interested in my existence here in this world and what that meant, and I was going to tell my story. Thanks, Barbara. <laughs> Thanks. All right, Chris. So you've made a you've made a career uh, out of photographing some of the most accomplished figures in our midst. Uh, you might be able to recognize Chris Hadfield up here on the on the screen. Um, what drew you to this line of work, making pictures of other usually famous people? Um, I've never had a different job. Um, I went out west to after high school to to make money to go to Simon Fraser or. or UBC. Well, I didn't. I, I foolishly went to Whistler <laughs> to do so, and didn't make any money. And came to the conclusion I really like skiing. This is really fun. Um, so I never really had. A, I never had a proper gig. And then I think my last job before I delivered pizzas at night in Whistler. And then. Um, my mother met the, the marketing director of the Toronto Sun on an airplane. A uh, kind gentleman, his name is Tom McMillan. We're still <laughs> friends to this day. Um, I call mother, she was worried about the livelihood of one of her children. I there you seems. go. Yeah, well, well, I'm wondering. There this. could have been. My mother does the same. <laughs> it was close to that, yes. Um, so I, I moved back to Toronto and uh, was, a, was an intern at the Toronto Sun for three months. Uh, at the end of the three months, uh, I didn't leave. Um, I, just, I just didn't leave. And the, they didn't like shooting entertainment gigs back then. Everyone thought, oh my gosh, I'm shooting hockey. And this was back in the day when like, the toughest decision of the day that they were going to make was what they were going to have for dinner. These, these like, newsmen still reeked of liquor and they wore Argo jerseys and it was like a real kind of men's den of old school news. It was kind of, it was neat to see the transition to like a real newsroom as opposed to the, like people smoke cigarettes and it was like, it was a hoot actually. Um, so that was my introduction to the world of photography and this and that and it was, I think my, the, the, I made a picture of um, Iggy Pop 
and um, I had Iggy take his shirt off, and he's, he's like, well, I'm not taking my shirt off. And I'm like, well, you're Iggy Pop. Like, <laughs> how do you photograph Iggy Pop with a shirt on? It seems like... Um, so, I, and then he, I, I laid him on a, on a hotel room bed. Often these kind of celebrity portraits, they, they, they take place in, in hotel rooms or weird places, and, and you don't have much time. There's a publicist in the room, and she's you know, looking over your back, thinking, like, well, just don't make my talent look silly. Um, Iggy's line was, if you make me look dumb, he's going to have his son beat the crap out of me, was his line. Um, he didn't beat the crap out of me. This, he kind of looks like Jackie Rogers Jr. in the picture. His hair is blonde and he's got weird bangs. Um, so I just started taking pictures. But initially it was, in, uh, I, right off the bat, I knew portraits was, was my thing just because um, I, I'm a sucker for conversation. Uh, you know, my my daughter giggles at the school pickup, like rolls her eyes because I seem to be talking to this person and that person. I'm just kind of fascinated. And suddenly I'm like fascinated because, oh my heavens, I'm like, Charlie, but did you see her eyebrows? They were huge. I'm like, I just thought we'd talk to her. She's like, oh. Like, but it seems like that's reason to make conversation with somebody. If you see something that's that like you just want to talk to them just to see how these things move or something. I don't know. Like it's, 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 I can't, I'm fascinated with faces. I really like looking at them. I'm staring at a bunch now, and it's like it's... I could say something about every one of them. It's really kind of a, just a treat to do. Does Chris, Hatfield, does Chris Hatfield's mustache move in a weird way? Uh, <laughs> no, that thing barely like moves at all. I'll tell you, it really does. It is... Um, I don't know if he'd know... I don't know if he'd like this. Okay, so go to photograph Hatfield, and um, his... Uh, what did I say? Something about the mustache, and his, I can't believe I'm saying this, and his wife said, if he shaves it off, he looks like my, my son, and I will never have sex with him again. <laughs> and I was like, well, <laughs> delightful, <laughs> delightful. Um, it was really, it was like, oh my God, really? Like, astronauts have sex or something? I don't know, but it was... So this guy, the joy of this guy, is he can make conversation with anybody in the planet strictly by starting a conversation by saying, well, when I was in space, <laughs> not bad, right? He's like instantly, he's instantly like Pope, president, dude on the street, no sweat. He is, he's got you with that, and that's pretty cool. So I'm, gonna, and I'm a sucker for people who, with big brains, rocket scientists, which he happens to be, or people who drive fast cars and do dumb things. He didn't just spend nine months in space or however long it was. He actually piloted the ship to get there, which is, I think at one point they're going 26,000 miles an hour. That's ridiculous. Like, it's just... So he's like, he's like a man with, like, man, nerd, Quebecois. He's not even. Mustache. Like, it's... That mustache is insane. Everybody should be Chris Hadfield for Halloween, I think. Like, just... It'd be so easy. So easy, ground control to my mustache, like whatever, the thing. You did promise you were gonna sing. So oh, well, I go. didn't, I didn't really, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. All right. And I wonder if that claim to fame is gonna bug him, like um, the, the whole singing thing. Like, uh, realistically, you, I have no clue what science he did up there besides how to make a uh, honey, honey and peanut butter sandwich, which my kids watch, which is fantastic. He t teaches you how, and how to brush your teeth, all these cool things. If you haven't seen any of the videos of him doing stuff for kids, it's completely entertaining. <laughs> so sometimes uh, you have photo shoots where you meet someone, it all happens pretty fast, and you kind of have to get in, get out, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes max. Um, but sometimes you follow, you do follow people uh, over time. And uh, you want to talk about uh, this picture and one of your favorite subjects? Um, I've been very fortunate with the Rolling Stones. The last three or four tours, I've been their kind of go-to guy as to, you know the $40 book that you buy of, like, the tour book? So I'd be the guy who would make those tour books, and we'd make them on, like, the first three or four nights of the shows. But the perk to prior to that is I would get to photograph the rehearsals, which they use, like, one or two pictures, but for, like, six or eight days, I'd sit cross-legged on a floor, often in Toronto when they, when they were rehearsing here. And it's like... You know, Keith saying, hey, man, let's play this. And, you know, it's remarkable. Like, Charlie Watts walks into a room and says, hello, Christopher. And you're like, oh, why, hello. <laughs> like, as if, you, as if you were not affected by it. But yet you're like, oh, my fucking God. Like, it's <laughs> ridiculous. 
Um, this picture, I think, is the second night in Boston, maybe Steel Wheels tour. And I saw it the first night from the side, and I thought, oh, this looks really pretty. And then the second, but I, I'm an incredibly perpendicular photographer. I don't like pictures from the sides. I like them just, they're square. That's the whole trick. So I thought, oh, well, I'll just move over a little bit to the right. Well, if I moved over a little bit to the right, I'm now standing right in front of Charlie Watts' stool. So this would be his view if he was on stage. My heart's pattering, pattering, pattering. I made whatever shot, like eight frames, walked off stage thinking, oh, this is going to be cool. I'm shooting film, so I can't look at it right away. Uh, about 20 minutes later, I'm kind of milling around backstage. Tony King, the band manager, comes up to me and goes, oh, Christopher, I'm sure that was lovely. The, the, the Stones have like two people to go to. It's either this gentleman, Tony King, who's been around forever, or this woman, Jane Rose, who's like, and that's Tony, Tony King's mix guy, and Jane Rose is, is Keith's guy, and they both like rule the show. Um, and Tony King was like, oh, I'm sure that's lovely, but nobody paid to see the top of your fucking head, because a bit little did I know, I'm clear as a bell. I'm lit up like a frickin' Christmas tree. <laughs> And like, so if you're in Boston that night, yeah, that's, my, that's my head in that picture, which I'd like to have, but I don't. But. And then they've used it a great deal, so. Excellent. Yeah. Tales from the road, and you've, so you've photographed them a few times. Fun to be around. Yeah. It really is fun to be around. I think, they're, I think they're done, but I did get to go to the Toronto show um, and make pictures, and like, so I didn't wear earplugs, and that's why I was at the ear doctor the other day. So it's serendipitous that my last, at my particular last outing with the Stones is the one that I go deaf at. So, <laughs> what a piss off. Remember it forever. <laughs> Whenever it's quiet. <laughs> Bloody nightmare. All right. So I've actually found my place in my own script again. <laughs> so that's uh, everybody. No quiz? In, no, no quiz. No <laughs> quiz. No quiz. Um, so back to uh, some of the things that you know, we've heard about your different careers, the different way you approach portraits, the sort of different contexts for which you create them. Um, but there's also things about how, so we've talked about sort of setting up shoots. So you talked about the last one, um, the typing on the emulsion of the Polaroid. Here we have really a kind of combined set of images. Um, tell us about the kind of planning and execution going in there or about the kind of ideas behind this particular, uh, this particular piece. Well, actually, I'm still thinking about how much more exciting Chris's life is than mine. <laughs> so I'm kind of lost in that thought, like, really? I don't get to hang with the Rolling Stones. And I get to meet some pretty great artists, but uh, you have a pretty exciting life. Yeah, no, it's great. Um, the series, again, Polaroids, very performative. All the work is very performative. Right? So again, I have a story, I have a narrative. I can't remember exactly what I said here, but I was angry when I wrote it. So it's something about being angry and blaming others, and then others wanted to blame me, and I wanted to blame them. So a um, series of six Polaroids set against, in, that was in the dining room where I was living at the time. So I liked using domestic spaces, not just a studio space. I liked it to be inside the home some point, and that was inside the home. Um, and I remember trying to pose and think, look angry. <laughs> so I took a lot of Polaroids, and a lot of them kind of weren't angry enough. And also being female, it was like, there's this sense, when I look at images of myself, it's like combination. Do I look okay? Do I look angry enough? But do I look okay? So there's this complicated feeling that goes on when, when you work with this. Because you want to look angry, but you also don't want to scare yourself the way you look in the image, too, frankly. Um, so with that one, instead of typing directly on the Polaroid, I typed underneath them more in a very traditional storyboard format. So you have a child's book, you have the image on one page, you have the text either underneath or on the other page. So in that sense, this is far more traditional other than the sequencing and the performative aspect of the movement of the body help to tell the story as much as the text tells the story. You know, the address in, in the, the, the kind of the they and the she, I mean, are, are you kind of infer that the she is the she in the picture, but the they is sort of un, um, you know, undefined in a way. And so it kind of the, I, I, I like how that, and this is a new, I think a 
newish strategy that's happening at this particular time where you, you would kind of ask the viewer to sort of identify in that sense or wonder if they were the they that is being um, called out in the picture. Um, well, I did assume that people, other people could look at it and relate to it and it might be their story too. I didn't always see them as so personal that no one else would ever be able to understand that because we've all felt anger, we've all felt frustration, we've, you know, common, there's a commonality to these emotions, so it wasn't specifically my anger, it was collective anger. Did you always know it was going to be self-portraits or did you try? No, I studied silversmithing and design before this, so okay. no, this was, pff, who knew? Uh, it's really, it's still going, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, Chris, you want to talk about uh, Our Lady Coco? Um, I guess what would be interesting about this is, here's a woman who, she's a model, um, and a very successful model for that matter. Uh, the difference of photographing somebody who knows that they have to kind of perform, because that is their job, as opposed to not being willing to participate and just kind of showing up and going through the routines and getting it over with. Um, Canadian Fashion Magazine hires me to shoot this, this lovely woman in the sense of like, you know, go make pictures that are yours particularly as opposed to that's my wind blowing fashion <laughs> picture noise. <laughs> which maybe didn't off. really work, but that's, it, I'll work on the sound of that one better. Um, so prior to, this, these are the clothes she, sh she showed up in. Um, we were actually working at my house. For some reason, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of shooting jobs and making pictures that are as close to my home as possible. I have no idea why. Um, I love the aspect of, you know, I walked here today. I like riding my bike. I like just there's, you know, as, as great as travel is, my favorite thing about travel is coming home. I know that sounds ridiculous, but... So this is where we, I said, oh, hey, let's just go for a quick drive. I'll, I'll show you a couple of the locations I want to shoot. And she hopped in the car and went for a quick drive. This is the uh, Peter's Garage at the corner of Peter and College. <laughs> really nice guy. That's Vaso in the background. If you need your car fixed, he is the guy. He's a really sweet dude. Um, so I went, this, I got out of the car to go ask Vaso if we could shoot here and blah, blah, blah. And I come back and she's sitting in the car and I said, oh, let, let's, you know, let's take a picture. Um, and she kind of stood there for a second, put one leg up, put the other leg up. And then I kind of posed her like that, which seemed, I don't know, it made a shape or something that seemed entertaining. My point being is, is we shot for the rest of the day, you know, we probably shot 40 or 50, 60 rolls of film or something like that. And I couldn't give a shit about any of the other frames except for this one, because this was the one that kind of was representative of this kind of woman on the, you know, borderline of massive stardom. She's a very successful model now. Um, and I just think if there's anything that kills me about it is you can't see her left hand, her, her left fingers, but. Yeah, but look at those toes. The toes are good. The toes make up for it. Yeah. So you, you talked about how nobody likes to have their picture taken. That's, you know, even how is it? Is it different shooting anybody else who doesn't like to have their picture taken versus the supermodel who or the nearly supermodel? And how do you coach her to sort of be herself when part of the job is to be a character or to kind of inhabit the clothes in a particular way or inhabit the moment in a particular way? Well, we would sneak off um, to go take pictures, and I brought um, like Kleenexes and stuff, and I would have her. What do you call that? Blotting. Blotting. I would have her just, <laughs> which seems ridiculous, but I didn't, she seemed a little made up, so I would constantly um, dumb her down a little bit fashion-wise because I thought that was going to be more representative of my work and I kind of wanted them to all look like found pictures particularly. Um, if she was smiling and I had her hair back and it was backlit, you could call it, I, those, th these images that circulate in advertisements and stuff, I, I call them uh, having fun without you pictures. You know, those like, ha ha ha, like, <laughs> I'm selling you something. <laughs> like, so I kind of wanted like that, but not, but not, but she's having, supposed to be like having fun with me and there's this like, there's a camera to subject kind of 
it's, it's half of a distance with my camera and like a sweet spot that I shoot in a great deal, but I do wait for countenance particularly. I'm not a massive kind of smiling picture. The queen's an exception or whatever, but I don't really, I more want kind of eyeballs and to something that thinks that ideally a viewer would look at it and think, oh, I wonder what she's thinking. Oh, she's thinking, this is uncomfortable. Why are you posing me like this? Is ridiculous, not very safe at all. Well, I think the, um, I know that I'm, I'm talking here on this kind of group of quest, set of questions and set of images we're going to show or kind of about things that you have in common, but I think this pairing of pictures, actually this Coco Rocha picture, Coco Rocha picture, and this one of Barbara actually kind of highlights some, some like a kind of key distinction where um, Chris is just complimenting Barbara. He can't turn it off. <laughs> well, at least I just looked at that. Good. Um, the... This kind of the the, the, the set of se serial images plus the text plus the sense of trying to expand it out of the image, expand a kind of moment or a sense of perception or an experience kind of outside the frame uh, by ganging them up by putting the text in. Uh, where we have with Chris, I think in, in, in all of your pictures, I think you want us to kind of stay in the frame, to stay to kind of look to. Uh, and there's like elements of it that are similar. I mean, there's similar elements to both those sets of pictures, but and yet the this kind of balance between like keeping your eye in the frame and kind of having you experience something outside the frame. Um, anyway, my brief editorial <laughs> onwards. Um, I want to talk about hands. So we're gonna. This is. These are. Uh, <laughs> care to share? I said they look good. I, on the monitor. We can see what's up and what's coming next, or something. And the, those two pictures look good. The other two pictures look good together. The car and the woman in the car and the, these images, I thought they were pretty. Okay. Uh, so these are from Barbara's next series called the Red Series, sort of in the early 80s. Um, and uh, I'm just going to read another thing here from uh, our, our man, Avedon. That makes me nervous whenever she reads. I know, it's going to be another <laughs> quiz. Uh -oh. Another quiz. <sighs> All right, I'm reading again, sorry guys. It's, um, it's shorter than the last one, I can tell you that. Um, so this is Avedon again. All portrait artists have to think about what to do with hands. It's not at all that a portrait is a kind of arrested moment in a stream of gesture. Gesture doesn't proceed in lockstep with thought. On the contrary, gesture in life always follows thought and precedes words. You extend your hand and you say hello, if you reverse the order, something else is going on. In a fixed image, there's no possibility of one act informing the other, nor is a gesture in a portrait just pantomime where the artist invents a meaningful gesture. Where the hands go is intimately tied up with the expressive quality of an image, its graphic rhythm as a whole, as well as its psychological and emotional content. I love it. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, I know. Why do we should just all go home, right? Um, just go read but, the book. <laughs> yes, do 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 that. However, uh, you know, I, I love that how he thinks about that. That gesture, sort of. Um, not even going to forget what he said, but you know, it's, it's sort of in between two states, uh, and that in fact you can pose them, but it's they actually are very very important to the picture. Uh, and I think uh, this set of pictures of Barbara's and the next one that I'll show of Chris's, I think you can kind of that comes across really clearly. So. Um, would you talk about Barbara? Would you talk about sort of uh, the the gestures here? And these are two from a, lar a larger series. Mm -hmm. uh, gestures obviously very important in how I shot that series, and also how I shot the type series too, right? Like the movement of my hand, the placement of my hand. I've also always been very uh, aware, and maybe because one of my parents said, like I have a skinny wrist and I have a big hand, like I have a sizable hand. So I was always aware that it's you know. It's there. Good for it's swimming. Not, yes, yes. And not that I thought it was a bad thing, but I was always aware of my hands, for whatever that means. But Clapping. I knew when I was shooting this uh, that my hands could be partially compositional device and facilitator. So when I'm holding things, it's how I'm holding it that shows you possibly how that object might be used or not be used, because I'm really, the triangle there is an architectural tool, but I'm kind of cradling it in a way that's really far more affectionate than it would be if it was really being shown as an architectural tool. 
Uh, and when I'm holding the Coca-Cola bottle, I remember shooting that one a few times to make sure you could see the separation between my fingers holding the bottle, things like that, very aware of what, how gesture can also create part of the narrative, right? It's not just, well, I'm holding a bottle, but I'm really holding a bottle. I'm really showing you that architectural triangle. Um, so gesture is incredibly important, and how you use your hands, or how I use my hands there to me became important. Also notice, it's one of the brightest spots in the whole image, right? It's brighter than even the face, the tonal range of the face, so your eye really does go to the hands holding the object, which then helps create what the story was about. This was trying to create a kind of narrative without using language, because the, uh, pardon me, the series before was the text typed in there, and when I showed that work in Europe, uh, I remember, I'm so naive that I thought everybody spoke English and could read English. So I'm showing it in Paris, and they're saying, this is really beautiful. I have no idea what you're saying. And I thought, oh, that's no good. So in this series, I thought objects can become language because you can hold something, and you might use a different word to say what that object is, but we all know what the object is regardless of what you call that thing, whether I say architectural triangle or you call it in your own language, something else. So objects became language. So gesture was a very important part of reinforcing what those objects were. Well, and the other objects around you in each case are also objects that could be held in the hand. So that sense of like, what's the tool? What's the action? What's the activity? What's the... Um, they're kind of wonderfully, they're both very concrete and mysterious at the same time. Are you mm -hmm. working alone when you make these pictures? I work all alone. Like I there's always no one work in the alone. Room with you, no, you're there's like... nobody in the room. It would drive me nuts to have somebody in the room watching me do that. It would make me so self conscious. I would just feel like, I can't I'm, do this. I'm a huge fan of, even though my jobs that I may need some help lugging some gear here and there that I never use anyway, I'm a huge fan of having little buddies around. Like they're not. They're not, you know, the world's greatest photo assistants in the sense of can do this and can do that and can do that. They probably can, but I've I never asked for them. Nobody in the room I've is never, a former photo I, assistant. I've Chris. never asked for them to do anything besides like. Are any of them in the room right now? Oh. <laughs> a couple of them. Okay. Oh, no, wow, yeah, three. But they, they're Don't like buddies. Them. <laughs> no, they're like buddies. And I would always introduce them as like, hey, these are my friends. I would never introduce them as like, oh, these are my, my assistants. Well, I sense. like having studio assistants help me with things that I can't do. So I have digital help sometimes. If I'm doing public art, I hire crews of people to help me do things that I can't do so that I'm not held back by my own physicality or lack of physicality. But when I'm shooting, I, I want it to be, I want to be able to get lost in the image. I want to be able to get lost in the camera. And as soon as there's another person in the room, I'm performing for them and I know it. You know, even if there's somebody very close to me, I'm all of a sudden performing for them and become very self-conscious. So, no, I always like to be alone. One last thing I'm going to say. You notice all the red objects around me? I spray-painted almost all my belongings red at that time for this series, and I look back on it and think, whew. Um, it's a lot of fumes. My phone, yeah, everything, all the fumes and this little teeny studio, but I wanted it all to be matching red, so it had to be the exact same spray can of red so they'd all match. <laughs> yes. Is that a kitty scooper? Yes. <laughs> it is. Do you recognize right. that? <laughs> I had a cat. It's not on. a fly swatter. No. Mr. Wall, would you tell us who, uh, uh, okay. whose hand um, this is? Uh, this is uh, Prince Charles's hands. Nice. Um, this was my as the. This was I think the second time I'd been on one of these royal tours. Again, you could I couldn't give this away to a publication if I tried at the time in Canada. I think Saturday Night ran this image after the fact, but. Um, but it took some convincing. I don't know why. Anyway, uh, like he is in Canada, so there should should be some news value to it. Anyway, so this was kind of uh, the all these all these news guys that cover the royals in the UK are a very tight group. And the first time they were like, oh, look at this dude shooting with these funny cameras, like as opposed to long lens kind of digi cameras and going where I would be like, walk around and be like, funk with the Hasselblad and they'd be like, whining film, and they'd look at me like, ha 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 ha, you're not going to make a dime off those things. Cause they're all very wealthy, 
Like, they've been doing it forever. Um, and the one guy brags, like, I shot the official portrait in 1971. And you're like, good on you, buddy. I don't know. And so it ended up, the kind of, they kept saying, oh, it'd be like, oh, we're going to take the piss. We're going to take the piss. Which kind of turned into me... I'm not really a, I don't know if I'm saying like a fan of the monarchy or not a fan of the monarchy, but it just seemed like uh, an interesting portrait of Canada when these folks show up. I was interested in the folks that would come and the kind of pomp and, and you know, so I would shoot pictures of the bands playing. I would often kind of, when they were around, I would just like not look at them and turn around and photograph everything else because that seemed to be way more interesting. Um, at this point, yeah, again, I didn't want to stand where everyone else was standing, so I thought I'm going to stand over here. And the woman's looking at me a little like, you can't stand there. So I sat on my, on, like, cross-legged on the ground thinking, well, that's a pretty defenseless look. Like, I can't really do anything if I'm sitting cross-legged. And I, like, fully shimmied on my behind with the other guys, like, looking at me like, what do you do? I'm, first of all, I think I'm in, I'm in all of their pictures. <laughs> And shot two frames with a 50 millimeter lens, like his butt is like this far from the camera. Um, to which other people were like, what were you taking a picture of? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Uh, he's got a Band-Aid on his finger. I thought that was kind of interesting. And then I thought it, was, it had only been a short period of time to some extent that he had, I, did he divorce that woman? Lady Diana? Did she, did, did was there an official divorce? I think she died separated? before that could happen. Okay, so, but it was, anyway, it was newsworthy that he wasn't, wasn't wearing the ring. Little did I know. I could have, like, it could have been on the cover of the sun, mate. You know what I mean? Anyway, so it was very exciting. And, and the thought of hands, look at those pudgy little things. Like, they kind of look like, <laughs> they look, I, I've, they kind of look like them, somehow. <laughs> So the, go back to the question of a portrait. This is, again, the kind of observed portrait in the sense of it's allowed to be my take on the dude. The cufflinks are adorable. And the Band-Aid is a winner. <laughs> if, if the Band-Aid wasn't there, I don't know if it would work as well. But the little pork sausages there are pretty cool. <laughs> and then you said about posing people with hands and stuff. Not to use references to meat, but like any time a hand comes up here, it's fully a piece of veal. Like it's like, because it overtakes, or people lean on it, and it's like then you're like, oh yeah, get get the good side of my cheek going towards my eyeball. Smooshing it's ridiculous. Head. So it's now it's we all know what hands not do to not do. touch, yeah. and you know like oh like if you can artfully like oh I did not see you there, you know like <laughs> like I don't know how Jane Birkin would be photographed. Oh, I did not know this button was. That's kind of a good use of hands because they are nice to. They are nice, nice to use. I photographed Conrad Black yesterday. Was it yesterday or the day before? Uh, third time this year. He's on a TV show called Zoomer. If anyone's seen it, oh my gosh. It's like, I, I watched, sat through a taping of it and we shot horrible. him at the end. I don't know, can I like say how bad I think it's gonna be? So Denise Donlin's like, hey, and we're here. We got Susie Smith cooking and we're gonna talk about sex with da 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 And then Conrad's like, and I'm gonna interview Bob Ray. It's like, <laughs> as opposed to like, He's got like zero, where he could be so good. So my line to him was like, great, okay, so this is a new situation. We're not selling books, we're not selling Harry Rosen suits. There's a couple of reasons I've photographed him recently. And I'm like, hey, so let's do something that might be, you know, a TV representative guy. And he's like, what? And I'm like, and as a joke, and then it's a quick answer, I said, how about like Ezra Levant? Which I don't know if you know who he is, but he's a fucking tool. <laughs> so I was like, he's like, no, I don't think that sounds good. So I was like, oh, so I brought a newspaper. And it, the picture, like, eh, works, it kind of doesn't. Maybe it'll age well or not. It's like I have him with a, with a National Post going. And it kind of doesn't work, but, like, maybe. I, I've never seen him do anything but stare you down. I would have, I wanted, I, like, Googled his prison name. I wanted to, like, only address him by his prison name. I went in thinking, again, because I want it so bad. I want like a picture of him to work. And the last time it sucked, and it was only a month ago, so I thought, oh, I'm going to go in this time and like make it or rake it. He's either going to hate me or it's going to, it's not. And then as <laughs> Nadia pointed out, the assistant in the room <laughs> helped me. On the way out, I gave him a whoosh with the newspaper right on the Kaiser. I don't know why, it just happened. <laughs> it's like getting loose. Setting it up for next time, yeah. I guess. Yeah. 
Well, all right. Well, uh, speaking of sort of icons in a certain way, I wanted to talk about, um, well, icons, photographic and otherwise. Uh, here we have a series uh, from uh, our two Polaroids from Barbara's series, Dancing with Che, wearing a T-shirt uh, with a famous photograph of Che Guevara. How, how, why? Where are we going? You know, sometimes I look at the series and I think it could have been Mick Jagger. It could have been any iconic person, but we were spending a lot of time in Cuba. So, you know, your life infiltrates your art. We were spending quite a bit of time in Cuba with our children at the time. And so you go to souvenir shops, you do those things as a tourist. And I became quite enthralled with this particular t-shirt because he's not wearing that military hat and he's got this beautiful hairdo. His hair goes like whew, whew, and his wavy, big, beautiful black head of hair there. And it was also a child-sized t-shirt. So when I tried it on, his body covered my entire front of my body and I thought, this is really good. I'm going to buy this t-shirt. Well, it's, you know, hung around the studio for a while. And then I kept looking at all the photographs that I had taken in Havana, and I kept looking at them and thinking, well, you know, I'm doing that typical poetic decay, and that's just so not me. I don't like to parachute into someone else's problem and photograph their poetic decay, because we find it beautiful, but the reality is it's really sad. So I put all of those in a shoebox, put them away, thought about it, and then one day just realized it was about the experience. It was about the sounds and the smells and just the feeling of being in Cuba and what that felt like to me. So I know it sounds so crazy when you explain how you actually create the work. I locked the studio door just in case anybody thought they were going to drop by. And I put on the T-shirt and I put on some black tights and I put on some music that I would bought there, and I started just dancing around the studio. And I'm dancing and dancing, and I thought, okay, I'm going to set up the camera, and I'm going to start shooting. Well, um, I shot probably 400 Polaroids that day, because it was just, I was having fun. And some of them were pretty bad, some were very good. And uh, as my children said to me later on, you dance like a white woman, Ma. And I looked and went, they're probably right, but it's okay, because really what my dancing did was animate Che, what it was like poltergeist. So my movement of my body, these images are a little more static, but some of them he just swishes and swirls across my body in a way that without me, he truly is dead, and all of a sudden I an animated him back into life. So I was, I was interested in that aspect. The other thing that really interested me about, it's all about this t-shirt. Sometimes I would wear the t-shirt with this very nice suit that I have. And I would have young people come up to me and ask me, oh, wow, cool, like, is, is that a musician? Is that a rock star? And I think, really, unbelievable. You have absolutely no idea who this person is. So I, I realized there is some generic sense, even though it is a totally, to me, iconic image, an iconic portrait. Uh, that there's a whole generation of people that he might as well be Mick Jagger or a rock star. Yeah, it's interesting how that, that kind of cultural currency passes out yes. of currency uh, can so quickly. All right, Chris, so here you are, so photographing. A, I'm another. 12 pounds lighter than I was in that picture. <laughs> <laughs> I've been playing a great deal of tennis. <laughs> So, in most of your photographs, you're not in your photographs. There are of other people. So, tell us about how this happened that you ended up in okay. the frame. Um, knew she was coming to town. Um, had done some work with some of the press people that... This is Marina Bramovich, by the way. Um, had done some work with the press people. Anyway, I knew the right person to call to say I want in. Um, and luckily, some people let me photograph people, even though I'm not, it doesn't end up anywhere. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It just seemed like the right thing to do, particularly. So she was just she just finished her performance. Yeah. So this is Moma. based off the kind of Moma stuff, and just everyone staring at her. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be interesting to um, to put myself in the picture, particularly as now half my friends are like, dude, what does the picture of your ear look like? Right, this is not <laughs> nearly. Thank you. What a, um, 
So we, I, I pitched her on the idea. She thought it was pleasant. For that matter, this day, we, and it'll probably never make the light of day, uh, I shot like a three minute video interaction thing of me kind of coming in and out of frame and like whispering into her ear. And she was very generous with her image. Um, and she's a, she's a marketing genius, this woman. Like she's really, I don't know if you fall for her work or not. I, I kind of, I'm a bit of a skeptic and I think, well, I'm not falling for that. And then you get in front of her and she's got like serpent eyeballs that like just, <laughs> and suddenly you're like, whoa, like, She's really, really good at kind of making face. Her face doesn't change, uh, like countenance-wise, because I'm thinking she's had likely a little bit of work done, so not much, <laughs> not much changes. But it's true. Um, but I don't, I'm not throwing her under the bus by saying that, am I? She admits to it. A little bit. She did. She, she, she did. Body it. art. Um, so I thought it was. I thought there was the. It was the proper time, and going in. And my friend is here, Jeffrey Harris, who is probably the, one of the finest self-portrait photographers around. Um, I was thinking of him, and I was thinking of you know, Cindy Sherman. And I was thinking of all these things. So it was a situation that I thought, well, if I'm going to try it once, this is a good one. And the joy is, if it sucked, no one would have known because no one would have seen it. I like how so many of your anecdotes as you kind of tell me about what job you're working on here or there are just about, oh yeah, I knew someone was coming to town so I got it called up and I got myself an introduction essentially and how the, 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 the excuse of making a portrait is in fact your kind of calling card or your, your, uh, the way you get to meet the people you really want to meet. Is that right? I've been very blessed with some of the people that I've made conversation with without question. You know, from the co-creator of the atom bomb to you know, rocket ship people, it's pretty, and lots of people in between. It's, it's, it's fantastic, and it is, uh, that may be going back to the selfish aspect of it, it is just, like it is, it brings me so much joy to walk out of these things. Like sometimes we are high-fiving, like, oh my God, that was awesome. And then like, you think the pictures are gonna suck? And then somebody says, no, 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 they're gonna be great, they're gonna be great, and I'm like, oh my God, they're gonna suck. But like that's, I, I've never really walked out of a gig and thought like, whoa, I nailed that. There's no way things could possibly be better. Like that's just never happened. And when I go into gigs thinking like, oh, what am I gonna do? I kind of use the guideline of the mental guide. One magazine I've never worked for is the New York Times Magazine. I've always wanted to. Uh, I've never even sent them my work for that matter. It might be a good idea to do so in order for them to hire me. But one, I always think like one more picture. What's one more good picture and then I'll send it. Um, where was I going with that? Ramble, ramble? Ramble, ramble. Anyhow. Let's go back so to Chris. So Chris Hatfield. Uh, these were for so McLean's. I'm going to ask you a question before you uh, start this. So this is a picture on the cover of McLean's. Chris just said that. Um, we're going to look at a few related to this photo session. I want you to talk about how, how, you know when it's, how you know when it's yours, when it's a kind of Chris Wall picture. Um... Get the call from McLean's to say, uh, would you want to photograph Chris Hatfield? Uh, photo and I have a good relationship. Um, he knows it'd be right up my alley. Needless to say, I'm all gung-ho. Uh, I pitch instantly. I'm like, oh my heavens, wouldn't it be great if we like put uh, Aladdin Zane makeup on the dude? It'd be great. And he's like, no, I don't know. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm like, I think it'd be cool. He's like, well, I don't think it's going to be a quick enough read. I don't think enough people know who Bowie is. You know, it's a McLean's reader. It's this and that, and I'm like, he's like, so I think it's probably best not to. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. I'm like, but I'm gonna probably do it um, anyway. Um, I think I might have even left the words probably out, but I just said, so I'm gonna do it anyway. And he's like, well, as long as it doesn't affect your time and this and that. So we get there, I've known the publicist, or the, it's a random house book guy. I've shot authors for him before. And he's like, oh, so I pitched it to his wife, Hatfield's wife first. Um, after the sex comment, we were seemed to be uh, in like Flynn. Um, no, no. <laughs> uh, the mustache remained, and the 17-year-old was nowhere near. Thank heavens. Um, so I lit this picture to look like to replicate that the, the 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 famous cover. It was like lights and gels and and a lot of hoot and hanny, which is not part of my repertoire at all. Um, and then if we flip to the next slide, 
this is the type of, this is my picture from that sitting. Like this is, this is the way I would like this. In fact, when I looked at, when I looked at contact sheets, this was the one image. When I first saw it, I was like, ugh, it's a shame that makeup's there because this is the closest thing to like, just this beautiful reflective picture of this man looking like, you know, one, I think if you put makeup on like that and you, you didn't know anybody and there's a bunch of people around, you might feel a bit like a, a little self-conscious of yourself and how, I was gonna say a knob, but like you would, I'd feel Space, silly. Spaceman. Like you'd be like, oh my heavens. So it took, a lot, it took a lot of like, no, 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 sir, I think this is really gonna be good. I think this is really gonna be good. Which yet I th thought, I don't know, I think this might fail miserably. So, but I did promise him, listen, if I think these suck, they won't see the light of day, and you know, thank you for participating and trusting me, and it's gonna be really cool. So, but I really, I, I'm a big fan of this print. The, the print itself is, is beautiful. Um, I've always kind of considered the final product of uh, photography in my work as kind of tangible items. Um, I do still shoot on film. I st still, you know, wait for my film to come back. Um, now, you know, we do scan images as opposed to project them with light, but we scan images and then the machine projects them with light, so the, 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 they're called digital C prints as opposed to digital chromogenic prints as opposed to just chromogenic prints. But I've always, fin I've always feel like the final, the final piece of work is something that you can hold in your hand and not, not something on, on a magazine cover or not something in, in a book particularly, but just the image itself and how you, you, could, you could crumple it, you could pass it to your friends, you, you could, you could treat it with kid gloves or you could, you know, sandwich it in between a book. But that was, that's always been the cool. final. So just to show you all three from that same sitting, um, did you try to get McLean's to take the one that you would have done, the one on the left? Well, at that point it didn't really, yeah. No, I thought that they would use that on the inside. <laughs> they, and they said they would, particularly, but uh, they didn't. <laughs> Um, I think it worked well for the cover. I, it it, it kind of works well for the cover. On one hand, you know, I hope it doesn't go down for his sake as something people will remember more than his great contribution to science. Like, it's a bit of a hoax, you know, and I'm not really much of a hokey dokey photographer. We just saw the, between me, the self-portrait with me and Marina, the, I thought that was pretty hokey. This is like tops the list of something hokey that I've done. Unless you decided to include the guy peeing in the pool. Did you use that one? I did not. No, thank gosh. That would have been like, you could have sandwiched them all up. You gotta buy the walrus for that. It's a portrait <laughs> of Russell Peters. <clears throat> all right, moving right along. I know we want time for uh, people to ask questions. So it's uh, just about 10 after eight. So I'm gonna, we're gonna move quickly through these. But again, you know, uh, th so this is another uh, series of Barbara scenes from a movie for one. Um, which in some ways I think sums up your work really beautifully. I've always loved that title. Um, but again, how do you know when it's yours? How do you know when it's done? Because this one in part has a lot of process. There's many steps going on here. Um, you know, talk about that. Okay, many, many steps. The original black and white photographs were photographed, uh, I would say, 1980 or 81 in a hotel room in Paris in a really upset state. Uh, very angry. Um, then I put those photographs away. I have a way of like doing something and then I got to hide it away until I know what it is I really want to do with it because I really didn't want those images to be public. I didn't want those you know, really angry images to go out there because it was just too personal at the time. So I went back. I don't know exactly what year these are, but I went back at that point and then I used a Polaroid close-up system to go in tight on the black and white photographs and just photograph tight sections of it so I would get close to the face or in the, oh, we're not there, we're only on the face one, uh, second one, or very close into the shoulder, which I think looks kind of like a Henry Moore sculpture on my shoulder. And I really wanted to abstract the images. I wanted them not to be me anymore. I didn't want them to be as recognizable as normally in all the past work. You, you, you knew it was me, or you knew, if you knew me, you knew it was me. Um, in this work, I needed it I needed to separate myself a little bit. So what they were were layers of Polaroids that I would peel apart and scratch, and once you, peel them apart and you actually rub the emulsion off, 
uh, you end up with this beautiful red tone. And I thought the red tone was really a good indicator and played off of what the emotion was at the time the images were taken, even though I was calmer, I wasn't angry anymore, that, like, that experience was over with. Um, but it's interesting how time sometimes can change it, and that's what allowed me to turn them into these very uh, material feeling, layered, scratched, distressed. The images are very distressed. You know how you use that word now for genes even, you know, like the distress, the, the gestural movement on the surface of the image, but extremely abstracted. I mean, that's my neck and my chin and my mouth, and I'm not sure I actually really look like that. <laughs> But I like the abstraction, and it's something that I still think about, how to take images of things that are recognizable and how to turn them into something that's more abstract. And you, I think, forgot to mention that you actually re-photographed them again and then printed them large. And this is some of the first oh, work yeah. I remember seeing of yours, and it has a very, you know, they're not, I, say, I, don't, I don't know if they're life-size. Are they life-size? Maybe they're slightly larger than life-size. Uh, almost, yeah. Some of them are life-size, and then I also printed a series 2024. Uh, it was one of my first forays into digital, and the digital prints were life-size, but then I went back in the darkroom and also printed them uh, back when we all were printing in color darkrooms, 2024. But I did prefer the larger ones because it just felt more physical. It felt like it engaged you, the viewer, on a more physical basis that way. So yeah, it goes through many uh, layers of process. And that's pretty typical of a lot of my work, to take it through one step and then another step and then move it through another step and then re-photograph that and then take that either into the darkroom or digital. But I'm interested in process and how process can inform the content, if that makes sense. All right, we're going to move through these. It's going to be pretty fast. I may or may not even ask you a question, but I'm just gonna, I want to put all these pictures together. We're going to do this. Um, Barbara did meet, uh, did meet and did work with some rock stars, just so you can see. Loverboy cover album inspired by uh, the letters series that you did. Um, you know, very, very much an allusion. You reshot it, but an allusion to the first one that we looked at, Dear Jared. Um, and, you know, as somebody who's kind of, I think, I think one of the things between Barbara and Chris, again, though the work is very different, I think you're both really restless experimenters, and I think this is, uh, this is hot off the press. This is a limited edition scarf, so Kathleen mentioned the scarves. It's from the newspaper series, and um, this is what Barbara was doing all day today uh, at Jonathan awesome. and Olivia, so there are uh, scarves, to be, scarves to be had. Um, but it's interesting, even in, in thinking through newspapers, which are mostly type, although increasingly I think that balance between type and image is changing, you, you've kind of played them, um, you've kind of pulled out Im image elements uh, through these newspapers over time and then given them a new life again on silk um, and uh, even as an installation in a shop. So I think that, that sense of context and um, I think it builds actually quite nicely on your recent installation of uh, Che, the, sh the, the shop that you couldn't go into. At least you can go in these, at least you can buy these scarves. Um, but the, the, this project you did at MoCA a couple of uh, months ago, um, merchandise that could not This be was made. shot at 3 o'clock today. <laughs> yeah, that's where I've been today. Yeah, pretty um, great. Yes, and it's Jonathan and Olivia. Go down and see it. 214 Alzington. <laughs> Oh, it I is on Ossington. <laughs> well, yes, Ossington, just so north there. Queen. I take it. Um, so moving on to some images of Chris's, I think the, you know, I think we're not going to say much about these just to get yeah, onto the questions. But um, okay, then go to the next one. All right. Uh, run into Sarah Angel. Sarah Angel says, "Oh, I'm writing about your friend Sherry Boyle for Walrus Magazine." I'm like, "What?" So I call Sherry. She's like, no, I don't want to have my picture taken. I call Brian Morgan, the art director. I say, I want to shoot Sherry. Can I shoot Sherry? He's like, sure. I call Sherry back. I'm like, I want to take your picture. They said, it's OK. And she's like, OK. If you're taking it, it's OK. So this, was to, this goes back to the kind of I'll be real quick in the sense of uh, images representing kind of time spent. Um, in this time spent, so the image, I guess, on your left is the one that was published. The one that's in the middle was the one Sherry loves that picture. She's like, oh my gosh, I love it, I love it, I love it. Whereas the one on the right is kind of, it's like a little risque in the sense, but it's kind of not, but it, I thought it was very representative of her work in Venice, which is this like serpenty things and kind of very representative of her revealing herself a great deal, yet we of these kind of family trees, yet we, we know so little about her. So it was kind of like somebody might be like, oh, 
Well, that's what she's like. Well, Sherry's not. First of all, to ask like your 42-year-old buddy to take her top off is ridiculous, like for one. So it was kind of just, we were both a little uncomfortable and you were just kind of like working through and then she's like, well, why the wet hair? And I'm like, well, I think it's like serpent-like and this and that, but the whole process was very, was, was, was like just so pleasurable. And it's so difficult photographing someone you know and let alone somebody you like because if the work sucks, it, it, it sucks even more generally. All right, moving along, uh, sometimes you, well, you talk about photographing the, uh, the, the people who are photographing. So uh, the one on the left is called Jennifer Lopez, the one on the right, I'm forgetting now, it's uh, politicians, G8. G8. Um, and even sometimes, oh. How does that one look? It looks great. This is my protest picture. The other two were from a series of um, news no, people working, no particularly. No more portraits, maybe, protest? Epic party? No more portraits, protest? No more portraits protest. Uh, I just like that it's the it's 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 the it could be the generic protest picture of all protests. Where they all kind of look the same, bullhorns, this and that. There's a little stars and stripes in there feel to it. Um, I won't say what it is, but it was shot on university. I did see them the one day. I came back the next day with the intention. I think I only shot like four frames. It was fun to look at, but I'm a sucker for how this this could mean so many things in the world of protest. Like they just look like they want change. And I guess that's what it's all about, so. So on that note, uh, I think we'll turn it over uh, have some questions and um, yeah. So we have a microphone for questions. If you want to ask a question, just raise your hand. But while we're waiting for that question to emerge, thank you so much for those insights into your process. It's pretty fascinating stuff. Anyone? Anyone? We've got more material we can keep Bingo. going. Bingo. Okay. <laughs> One moment. Um, I'm wondering, for both of you, like, what have, who have you been your influences? Or as a student at OCAD too, it's like you look to, maybe you see someone that you kind of imitate a little bit while you're learning or that you are intrigued by because of their style. Have, do you guys remember or who have been the artists that have kind of maybe uh, helped your direction be what it is now? I'm a fan of so many artists, but I don't think their work directly <laughs> relates to my work. I think I was working in such, such isolation that I can't really say there were real direct influences other than at that time period, it was coming out of a time, probably names you're not gonna know, like Betty Hahn and Bee Nettles, and they were early feminist photographers who were sewing and embroidering directly on their photographs, and I had seen some of that work, so I remember thinking that it was really, I love the personal aspect of it. Um, but I'm inspired by so many things that it would be hard to just, you know, attribute that to one specific artist. I'm inspired by just so much. So, it's not one. You're studying photography at OCAD? No, I'm painting and drawing. Yeah, painting and drawing. Um, but she's in my class, class, I know. Because needless to say, I think every photographer, you know, should be aware of the masters and, and what came before us and you know, I think you know, if I was born in a certain period of time, my work w would have likely have been different if I had studied and kind of emulated other people's work. Um, I definitely shoot with a Hasselblad because Irving Penn did and how many, like there was, it, the tools I chose were because it seemed like other people were doing those back in the day, so. Um, but then I'm just as influenced as like, you know, kids' drawings and this and that, like there's so many cool things that you think, oh my heavens, if somebody did something like that, and you did this and that. Like you could just pull little things out of so much from so little. So it's just a matter of kind of not closing your eyes and in fact opening them even a little bit more and looking for something to, to you know, seeking inspiration, should, you shouldn't have to you know, go far. It could be, it's right there, like without question. I hope that answered, I don't know. I suppose it's saying Irving Penn, good heavens. Jane has a question. Uh, 
Uh, Barbara, this is for you. Um, the two-part question. I really thought it was very interesting to see the scarves hanging like that vertically. Obviously, I haven't seen the installation yet because it opens tomorrow. But two things occurred to me. One is um, when you exhibited them, the newspaper strips were horizontal and it had a certain effect having these newspaper strips go so high. But I have to say, I really like them vertically, so I wanted to know how you related to seeing them vertically. I mean, mind you, I know it's on fabric, um, but they seem very interesting that way. And also, how did you, why, you've used cloth before and other structures for your photographs. What inspired you to make scarves? Like, I think that's really neat. Uh, I totally love that installation, but how did, why did you do it? Well, the first two-part question here, they always trick me up. <clears throat> I had to think about the body when I was thinking about a scarf. So it wasn't about viewing it on the wall and reading it the way you would read either from right to left or left to right. When all of a sudden thinking about wearing the art, I had to think how it would lay on the body, how it would interact with the body, how you wrap it around, where it goes. You know, Do you put it around your head? Do you hang it? You know, so really it was considering the body. It's almost performative again. How does the scarf and the body perform together? Um, and I made my first scarf over well over a year ago when one day I was just thinking, I was looking at scarves because I shop like any other human and I thought, I think I could do better. It was that moment of, and so I re I re-examined some of the newspaper series. None of those are the exact duplicates of any of the newspapers, and I reconfigured to have more portraits. A lot more people are in them, and less text, um, and less kind of data. I didn't want dates and information, and I didn't want to be wearing a big ad that said Lord and Taylor in, in large text. That was fine on the. Uh, horizontal version. So by reconfiguring them, I could think about where they fell on the body. Now, the first one that I did, actually, some of the images were hidden around my neck, and I thought, well, that's a mistake. I have to have the images flow down my body. So there are prototypes I made. And uh, I worked with this company in San Francisco, fantastic, an American you know, made product here. And I would do samples, and they'd send them back. And finally, I came upon where it's like, this is the way I want it to be. And it just seemed like a great idea at the time. But then it was, what do I do with this now? That was the funny part. Because I live in the world of art, in museums, in galleries, not in retail. I don't understand retail. But very luckily, wonderful young, very talented designer, Jeremy Lang, and his partner, Frank Grigg. I'm sure you're familiar with their work. Well, I just. I know them and said, let's meet, talk to them and said, what do I do with this thing? It was kind of interesting. And they, were, they had, were full of ideas. This is how you market it. This is what you do, blah, 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 blah. And I thought, OK, I'm going to give it a try. I thought it was fun to do um, an intervention with a clothing store. I'm not sure if this is something that will become ongoing for me or if it's just a one-off project that I'm doing. I haven't given it any more thought other than I've made these four designs, and that's that. We'll see what happens. I think there's, um, if I can just make one comment, I think it's a pretty interesting sort of full circle to some of the early works, even like Carol performing lilac tricks, which are fabric pieces. Yes. I mean, they're uh, this, uh, that kind of thread through. Absolutely, good point. No pun intended. I think we've Very got good point. for one more question. Yeah, I, th I think it's a question more for Chris, but I'm not 100% sure it may apply to both. But when you, we're in an age now where digital technology is transforming most things in our life. And I'm curious, being a traditionalist and be, being respectful of film in the past and you know, going into the um, lab and printing beautiful prints by hand, I know you still appreciate that. Are you excited by the use of technology and digital manipulation of photographs and the possibilities of its impact as art or reality, I guess, as art or changing reality or the ease of it all and how so many more people are quote unquote photographers now in a sense with their Instagrams and, 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 and the ability to self-express and spread the images. I mean, where, what's your, where do you stand on all that? Well, I don't, I don't think 
One, I use the film camera particularly because uh, I've built a career making images that look like my images, and I can't find that with any other camera that's out there. And once you put a digital back on the camera that I use particularly, it, no, it becomes no longer full frame, so my 80 millimeter lens becomes a 94 millimeter lens, mm -hmm. and that little difference makes all the world to me. I don't think gallerists or people who buy prints uh, give a hoot how the picture was made, as long as it looks great on the page and it they're f makes them feel good, then that's cool. I don't agree with that. You don't? No. I don't, yeah, okay, that's good to know. Okay, I, then I don't think everyone <laughs> thinks, <laughs> I don't think everyone thinks, <laughs> you've completely threw me off. <laughs> No, okay, so uh, am I, am I willing, absolutely willing to change? Am I like, you know, being some dark horse stuck in the past because I think that's where I want to be? No, absolutely not. Um, I'm embracing all the technology that I possibly can to enhance the ability for me to make pictures without question. It just happens to involve some older tools in the process. And that is because that camera is, produces a sweet spot for me. If, I, if you could keep record of like, every frame where I was between like three and a half meters or two and a half meters or whatever it is, it is there often gonna be bang on. Like it's so, that's my spot, it's my thing. And then I am a sucker for the analog aspect of it just because it makes me feel, there's like no feeling in the world like sitting on a sofa with your loop and your grease pencil after you've gotten your pictures back and looking at pictures. It's my time, my hair could be on fire, I wouldn't know, I'm just like, ah. <gasps> I'm either really happy or really sad. And it's like, the buzz from each of them is, just makes me feel pretty cool, so. It's a, it's a good note to end on, the looking at pictures. So again, if you haven't seen the show, please visit the exhibition. And before I thank you once again, I just want all of you to know that um, tomorrow night, same place, same time, seven o'clock, we're joined by Paul Graham, who's a British photographer currently based in New York. His work is also featured in the Light My Fire exhibition, there are still tickets for his talk. It's kind of exciting that he's here in Toronto, so I hope you can all join us for that. But for now, um, again, Barbara, Christopher, Sophie, thank you so much for sharing thank your you. thoughts with us. Thank you.